Hi everyone, welcome back to the AI language. So today we are breaking down one of the most important concepts in model context protocol, which is authentication and authorization. What you see on the screen is a multi-agent MCP plus A2S system. And this is what we've already built. So we have just to recap, we have built an MCP server. We have built an MCP client. We have connected it through the MCP config.json to the host agent, which is an orchestration agent that can use any of the tools that it wants to. Similarly, we have an A2S a branch shown in red over here and we built a remote agents uh, used a2a servers using the a2a protocol to connect them to a2a client and connectors and again there was a discovery process involved over here and the user then interacts with some kind of a front end app front end uh, with the host agent and sends requests and the host agent can then connect to these mcp servers and to the remote a2a agents all right now all this works good if you trust all the mcp servers you trust the remote agents and the agent uh, the remote agents and the servers trust you right in a real life scenario you might have third party mcp servers and then the user will need to authenticate themselves to the server and also to check you know for authorization that what all resources on the server can this particular user access so for that we use what's called authentication and authorization now very simply in this green branch over here the client needs to authenticate itself to the server which means that it needs to identify who the user is or who the user is that is using this mcp client and the other thing is that the servers need to check what is the level of authorization the clients have that is once they know who the client is they need to check what all resources can the clients access on the server so for example if there are five tools the client might be only authorized to call two or three tools and not more than that right so that's authorization and that's what we are going to build in inside the mcp client branch so today we are going to understand all the theoretical aspects of it and understand how this works and in the next lecture we are going to actually implement this so to understand what are the steps involved in authorization and authentication we are going to shift to mcp spec on their website and this is a sequence diagram that they have over here to show all the steps involved so i'd request you to please keep this handy like bookmark this so that you can actually refer to this as this protocol develops it's pretty new mcp overall is pretty new so you know they might change things here and there and uh, when we implement this we'll actually use a library so that a lot of these updates will be handled by the library developers and you know um, less number of updates will come our way but we should be you know uh, aware of this fact that mcp is something that's developing very very fast this can change and then you know we might need to update our code accordingly so we'll keep all these references handy all right so let's start so mcp uses open authorization or oauth ecosystem and it consists of four key elements or roles so one is the user agent browser over here which is the resource owner so you as the user own a resource and you want to access it and you'll authenticate yourself using a browser and that is what this represents all right now the user will access the, this data using a client all right so this client over here is the mcp client and this is our application that is trying to access the resource or the data on a server on an mcp server on behalf of the user so that is the client and that's the second element over here the third element or role is that of the mcp server which in our case is a resource server so we can understand that the mcp server is providing us access to some kind of data or some kind of tools which are our resources in general and the mcp server is what the mcp client will connect to and it will use the authentication that it has uh, based on uh, you know provided by the user in form of a token and then access those resources so that's the mcp server and the, lastly the fourth one is an authorization server so an authorization server is a third party server and uh, this authenticates the users and issues tokens so for example it can be a thought of like the google's auth system and when you sign in to Google on a browser, it will provide you a token. And that token is what authenticates and authorizes this particular user and their client application to access the resources on the server. So why do we have these four roles? Because this OAuth ecosystem now allows a client application to access a resource server on behalf of a user without the client ever seeing the user password because the user is going to authenticate themselves to the authorization server which is then going to give back a token all right so the client does not see the password of the user to understand this with an example you can think of an mcp client that helps you organize your google calendar data so you're going to type in a query in an mcp client that you know can you please set up a meeting or can you please move this meeting and so on and that will connect to an mcp server that can connect to your google account 
All right. Now the MCP server needs to be sure that the person who is typing in these queries into the client is actually authorized to do that. So for that, we'll use an authorization server. So we can use Google sign in, right? The user will actually log in in a browser to their Google account. So they don't provide their Google password to the MCP client. The Google uh, login system or auth system is going to provide a token. And that token is then what's going to be provided to the client, which authorizes the access to the MCP server or the resource server that allows the access to the calendar data. So that's how OAuth allows the client application to access a resource server on behalf of a user without the client ever seeing the user's Google password or any, any password for the resource that it's trying to access. So now that we know all these entities that are involved, let's see how they fit together. So first is the discovery process. All right. So over here, the client will send a request to the MCP server without a token because it's, it doesn't have the token to begin with. And the server replies with a 401 unauthorized request, but it also sends this www authenticate header telling the client where to find its metadata. All right. Then the client requests the protected resource metadata from the MCP server. So this is going to be hosted on a endpoint like slash dot well known slash OAuth protected resource. That endpoint is mostly what is used. And then the MCP server is going to return that particular metadata uh, to the client. Inside that metadata, the client is going to find the authorization server URL. So it's going to hit the endpoint on that URL, which is dot well known slash OAuth authorization server. When it hits that endpoint, the authorization server metadata response is going to come back to the client over here. And this is going to inform the client about all the available endpoints, flows and capabilities. So this completes the discovery process. And now the client knows which authorization server to use and how to talk to it. So now that the client has discovered the authorization server, the next step is how does the client identify itself to that particular server? So in all uh, OAuth systems, every client needs a client identity. So it's like a badge for the client. And this badge has a client ID. It's a public label like the badge number. And sometimes it also has a client secret. So it's like a private password, like the pin you use with your uh, badge or laptop or whatever, right? So this tells the authorization server, so here's who I am. And it helps decide what client is allowed to do. There are two kinds of clients in OAuth. So there are public clients, so apps that run in places where they cannot safely keep secrets, all right? So like a mobile app on your phone or a single page app running in the browser, because anyone could, you know, decompile the app or view the browser code. And these clients don't get a secret. They only get a client ID. And there are confidential clients. So apps that run in secure environments like backend servers where secrets can be stored safely. So an example would be a company's server side application running in a data center. And these clients get both a client ID and a client secret because the secret won't leak easily. So a public application or public client, there's no secret. It's there's no trusted, uh, not trusted to hold a secret basically. And a confidential one, like, you know, running on a backend company server, it gets a secret because it's trusted to keep it safe. So how does dynamic client registration or DCR work? Normally you would have to go to a server's dashboard and fill out a form and manually get your client ID and client secret. But with DCR, the MCP client sends a post request on the register endpoint to request the authorization server. And this request includes things like redirect URIs, where the authorization server should send users back after login. What kind of app it is, like is it public or confidential? Maybe some descriptive information like the app name. The authorization server checks the request against its policies. So does the redirect URI look safe? Like does it have HTTPS? Is the client type allowed? Does the server allow automatic registration at all? If everything looks good, the authorization server responds with credentials. So for example, it will respond with the client ID. It might include a client secret. It might include a timestamp at which the ID was issued and it would have the redirect URIs. So now the client has its official badge. It has a client ID and maybe a client secret and can use it in the future token requests. So why is this good for MCP clients? Because they don't need to pre-register with every possible MCP server in the world. So there's no manual copy pasting of IDs or secrets. Everything happens automatically, which makes MCP plug and play. But DCR might not be supported like with Google sign in. So in that case, the client must use a pre-registered client ID hard coded in the client or the user must manually provide the credentials. So that's the dynamic client registration step. Essentially, it's how the client gets its identity badge before it can ask for tokens. 
All right. So this alt block around the dynamic client registration means that if the authorization server supports DCR, the client auto registers and receives the client credentials. If the authorization server does not support DCR, the client must already have a static client ID and maybe a client secret as well, or the user admin must provide them manually. So then we have generate pixie parameters include resource parameters. So what is PKCE or pixie? It stands for proof key for code exchange. All right. And it's a security mechanism designed to stop attackers from stealing the authorization code during this flow. So how does this work? So this basically works by the client first generates a random string called the code verifier. And you can see it over here. And this is presented later on in the flow to the authorization server, but uh, it first hashes this code verifier into another string called the code challenge. All right. And this code challenge is sent up front through this user agent over here. So let me just scroll this down. So this code challenge is sent up front through the user agent to the authorization server. And later when exchanging the authorization code, the client must present this original code verifier over here. And this just guarantees that only the client who started the flow can finish it. All right. And what is the resource parameter over here? So this is what identifies the MCP server. This is the URI of the MCP server the client wants to talk to. So it ties the token that you'll receive at the end to the right server. All right. And if the token is stolen, it won't work on other servers only on this particular server. So now the client will build the authorization URL and it opens the user's browser with that URL. This URL points to the authorization server's authorization endpoint and authorization request with resource parameter is sent to the server. The query string might contain several parameters like it might have the client ID. It might have the redirect URI, which, uh, which the server will send the user back to after login. It might have the response type like code that we are asking for a authorization code. It will have the code challenge over here and might have the code challenge method, which means that uh, we are using a particular kind of hashing like SHA 256 or something. It will have the resource and the resource will basically be the MCP server. This token should be valid for. Then it will have scope, which is optional and it defines what kind of access required, like read, write, etc. It might have a state, which is a random value that the client generates to pre prevent CSRF attacks. So there can be multiple of these values. We'll not go into the details over here, but there's an authorization URL that will be opened in the browser. This will send an authorization request with the resource parameter to the server. Opening the browser here ensures that the user interacts directly with the authorization server and not through this client app over here. So the client does not see how you are uh, getting this authorization done. It does not see your passwords and so on. So the browser has sent now this request to the authorization server and the server will check a few things like is the client ID valid? Uh, does the UR redirect URI match what it expects? Is the resource parameter well formed and allowed? Uh, are the scopes that are requested, are they, are they permitted? If all this looks good, it shows the user a login consent screen. And over here, the user authorizes. The user, the user logs in, which is authentication, and is asked to approve or deny the client's request, which is authorization. If they deny, the flow ends here. If they approve, the authorization server continues. The next step in this line is to redirect to callback with authorization code. So once the user authorizes, the authorization server redirects the browser to the client's redirect URI. In that redirect, the server appends a code, which is a short-lived authorization code, like a claim check for a ticket and a state, which must match the state value originally sent. And this prevents CSRF. CSRF, by the way, stands for cross-site request forgery. And it's a type of web attack where an attacker tricks your browser into performing an action on a website without your consent, but using your already logged in session. So uh, as an example, imagine you're logging into your bank's website in one browser tab. Normally, if you click transfer $100 to XYZ, the bank checks your session cookie and processes it. Now, suppose an attacker sends you a malicious link to click. If your browser is already logged in to mybank.com, it will automatically include your cookie session info when loading that uh, request. So, uh, you know, you might just um, unknowingly authorize a $1,000 transfer to the attacker without knowing it. So that is CSRF and it forges a request in your name piggybacking on your login. So in OAuth flows, the state parameter is a random string generated by the client. When the server redirects back after login, it includes the same state. And if they don't match, the client rejects the response. And this ensures that the redirect came from your request, not a forged one. So not going to go into more details over here, but that's uh, what's done over here. And the browser hands this redirect back to the client application.
Now the next step is authorization code callback. So at the client's end, the redirect is received. The client extracts the code. So now the client exchanges the authorization code for the token. So there's a token request. It puts forward the initial code verifier, which is the original random string. And it uh, also provides the MCP server URI. There would be other parameters included as part of this post request. And finally, the server compares the code verifier to the earlier code challenge and ensures that they matches. If all the checks succeed over here, the authorization server responds with a JSON. And this JSON would have an access token, the credential the client will send to the MCP server. It would say what is the time it is valid for. So there'll be an expires in parameter and there's a refresh token. So this is optional and it lets the client get a new token later without making the user login again. And once this is done, you know, we have authenticated and uh, authorized ourselves. And now the MCP request can go ahead with the access token that's, that it has received over here. So it's a retry of this original request that was done over here without the token. And now this time it should succeed because we have a valid access token and you get an MCP response back. So if the token checks out, the MCP server processes the request, and sends back the response. And from here onwards, you know, all the requests between the MCP client and server include the same authorization that is bearer access token. And this is in the header until the token expires. And if it expires, the client can use the refresh token if it was provided to get a new access token without bothering the user again. So this is the entire flow that happens for the authorization. So what we're going to do is now that uh, now that we understand how the authentication works in MCP, we're going to implement a simple example in the next lecture. So please wait for that lecture to come up. And uh, what we're going to do over there is we are going to hand over all the complications over here to a library. Most likely we're going to use fast MCP, the newer version of it that's available. And that will help us, uh, uh, you know, do all this, all these steps in the uh, authentication flow. And we are going to use an authorization server like Google to sign in over there. Again, we are going to let the library handle all these details and we're going to implement it in a simple client server application so that you understand this well and how it works. So again, a note to make over here is that MCP is a fast evolving protocol and these things might change. So please do bookmark the specification for the authorization flow steps and how the authorization works. And if there are any changes, do update your code and do follow them as they evolve. Same with the implementation and the libraries that you're using. Using a library or a using a particular solution just helps us so that, you know, uh, all the mechanisms that are followed over here are updated internally by the library developers and we need to make minimal changes. But whatever those minimal changes are, we should keep a track of how MCP is developing and make those changes to make our connections from the MCP client to the MCP server secure. So thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in the next lecture.